Hey, how are you? Um, I'm Michelle Delano with Delano Law Group, and we're live today waiting for Melissa to join us. We're going to be talking with Melissa Rosenberg, licensed clinical social worker and um, private practice therapist about managing stress and life transitions. So I'm just waiting for Melissa to see when she's ready to get on. Oh, here she is. Okay. Melissa, are you there? Hang on a second. Here she is, I think. Let me see. Sorry. Let me see if I can get this to work. Oh, hey, there you are. There I am. Lighting's hey. not there. <laughs> All right. Well, Melissa's here. She's outside on a beautiful Seattle day. So that's good. All right. Well, we're going to talk about stress because that's the number one thing that is a big crossover with what I do, what Melissa does, and probably what every single person who's watching does. Um, so stress is a thing, right? Sure is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what I thought we'd talk about first is I wanted to just ask you, when someone comes to you, how do you about, first of all, why don't you tell everybody who you are before we even get started? Tell, tell everybody who you are. Sure. Yes. I'm Melissa Rosenberg. Um, I've been a mental health professional for over 16 years. Um, I am currently operating a private practice and the name of my business is Better You. Um, and I really try to work with my clients to kind of find their healthiest path forward and um, optimize their strengths in order to do that and first identify their strengths and then them in order to do that. Um, I work with adults of all ages and I also work with couples and my practice focuses on working with clients who are experiencing significant emotional distress or adjustment challenges or communication difficulties and I really have a bit of a um, specialty focus on relationship transitions. Yes. Life transitions. Um, that could include divorce or separation or other family changes, parenting changes could also mean the death of a loved one or other health changes that might be happening and, and grief associated with that. Um, and then many of my clients are struggling with depression or anxiety or addiction or trauma or, or any or all of the above. Right. So that's a bit about me and what I do. Like I said, I work with individuals and I also work with couples. Um, and, and yeah, I'm excited to talk a little bit about stress today. All right. All right. So when someone comes to you for any of those reasons, tell me this. Um, what's the first thing that you do to help them figure out a good path forward? Well, I mean, I think we're talking a little bit about life stressors, right? I mean, yeah. life stressors come in the form of transitions a lot of the time. And transitions can be expected or unexpected. Um, it could be a welcomed transition, a job change. That's going to be a good one. Or Definitely. getting... You know, something that you want um, or unwelcomed, something that was, you know, imposed on you and not chosen. Could be sudden, could be gradual. Um, but in any case, transition means change and change usually means uncertainty. And uncertainty is certainly something that I've struggled with over the years and generally is um, something that breeds fear and anxiety and stress, even for good changes, right? And so when we think about life stressors, I really want to help people kind of narrow in on what their response to this life stressor looks like. How are they coping with the stress? How are they coping with the change? Um, if the change involves loss, how, where are they in the grief process? Uh, so I really try to work with clients to kind of understand their own emotions, try to figure out how to walk through their emotions. I think most of us have the natural inclination to try to bury them, avoid them, distract from them, you know, when mm -hmm. it comes to emotions. Um, but generally, it really is walking through them and learning how to understand and walk through your emotions that enables us to heal. So that's kind of a general path I work with on with folks on, on stress management. That's great. And you know, we've been in the pandemic. And now we're, I mean, I won't say this over, but we're beginning to emerge from the pandemic. Can you talk and just tell tell everybody how you've seen people's stress levels go up in the pandemic? What are some things that they can do now as we transition yet again to a little bit more normalcy with all of the vaccine um, availability? And what tips do you have for people as they transition yet again, kind of out of the pandemic? Um, so just tell, tell us a little bit about that because I think it's something that's impacted everybody. I know it's impacted my clients. I know it impacts friends. It impacts everybody in some way. So how are you helping people deal with that stress as they now transition out? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic, of course, has taken such a toll on all of us, uh, physical and emotional health in many different ways. I think I've noticed that most of my clients um, have really struggled with isolation and feeling disconnected, loneliness, a lot of really extreme loneliness. Um, 
and just life imbalance, you know, life structure as they, they'd known it was, as we've all known it, has been shifted and people have had to really adjust. But that uncertainty that I talked about before, you know, has really come about when it comes to this pandemic, right? Heightened emotions related to uncertainty, anxiousness, worry, fear, panic, depression, sadness, grief, all of those things, I think, have rose to the surface when it comes to um, pandemic life over the past year. You know, yeah. loss could involve a lot of things. I mean, many people have lost a loved one to COVID um, and, and related to health struggles right now, which is you know, incredibly, and loss also comes in other forms, you know, it could, loss of time, we all lost time, we all lost, you know, hopes and dreams and things we're planning to do this past year, For real. Um, our loved ones, you know, um, people lost jobs, people lost money, <laughs> you know, yeah. a lot of losses happening. Um, and that's been tough. Parenting challenges, I'm a parent and it's been extremely hard to navigate online school and my own children's emotions when I'm trying to deal with my own um, and the uncertainty that lies ahead when it comes to the pandemic. Definitely. I mean, I think it's important for people to know that they're not alone in dealing with this. And now as we transition out of it, what are you, what do you recommend for people as they start to kind of get used to again, a new normal? Yeah, I mean, I want to say one other thing. I think relationship stress, that's something that I've seen heavily in my practice, working with couples and also with a lot of individuals who are going through divorces and separations. Um, relationship stress has been heavily impacted by the pandemic. People being forced to live together and forced, you know, forced to spend more time together than they're comfortable with. Um, loss of life balance. Domestic violence has unfortunately been a bit on the rise during this time of heightened stress, right? people kind of reevaluating what they want for their lives and their relationships. So a lot of that also, I just wanted to make that point has been huge in terms of um, what's happened in the pandemic. Um, I'm too, right? I'm, I'm, I'm under the impression that divorces uh, are up this year. Yes. No, divorces are up. Um, separation is up. And I think it's had an impact on people that, you know, we couldn't have imagined in, in, a negative way. Um, I think there's a positivity because in some ways it's having people realize, like you said, evaluate what they want, right? And I know you've seen that probably just in your practice, people saying, I don't want to do this anymore and I don't have to. So that's a good thing, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. People have made the decision to make some really big changes that, that they yeah. have been sitting on for quite some time. And that's one of the things I work with clients on is trying to tackle ambivalence and, and struggles to make tough decisions. Um, and that's, I would say, something that's been a bit of my practice over the past year. But you asked about, you know, what about coming out of the yeah. um, Because people are having to shift again, right? I mean, life balance was disrupted. We've all kind of been through some something emotionally. Yeah. And, um, and so I do think it's kind of continues to be a challenge and will continue to be a challenge while we have to make more emotional shifts and mindset shifts. I think I want to suggest that people just really try to be um, as mindfully aware of their emotions as possible and looking for red flags within themselves right. to recognize and stress is really taking a toll. That could be, you know, coming out of the pandemic or changes as the pandemic, you know, um, as life begins to get a little bit more back to a new normal, or it could be even related to any life stressor. But take, take stock of what things are like, right? Are you sleeping a lot more? or a lot less than usual? Are you having a hard time falling asleep? What's your appetite been like? Are you eating more? Are you eating more? Um, having trouble concentrating, having trouble focusing that's, that's different than your norm? Are you finding yourself uninterested or not finding pleasure in things that you normally enjoy? Um, are you withdrawing? And this can be a little harder to recognize these days because people aren't socializing as much and haven't been socializing as much. But hopefully people have figured out their ways to connect, whether that be on FaceTime or texting or talking. Um, but, you know, are you finding yourself withdrawing or disconnecting more from the outlets that you were using? Um, and what's happening with your inner dialogue? Are you finding yourself having more negative self-talk than usual or noticing automatic negative perspective on things? Um, I don't know if any of these things are happening. I think it's a good time to reevaluate how you're taking care of yourself and whether you might need to incorporate uh, managing your stress in a healthier way and, and boosting, boosting yourself a bit. 
definitely. That's that's perfect. And it kind of actually lends itself to the next thing I wanted to ask you about. So obviously we do divorce and separation and we've been lucky enough to partner with you with a, with a lot of um, discussion around that in the past. And I'm wondering if you can just tell everybody what the differences are in some of the major things that you do. You do discernment counseling, you do divorce ambivalence counseling, obviously you do regular individual therapy and couples like you talked about, but can you just tell everybody the differences between divorce ambivalence and what that is and discernment counseling? So anybody that's watching or anybody that gets to catch this later can um, understand that those are options and what they're really all about. Because those are terms that get thrown around and not everybody knows what they mean. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, I work with both individuals and couples. I work with adults. Um, when it comes to couples, I, I'm trained in the Gottman method, and I definitely pull from Gottman theory and interventions in my work with couples. I work with couples who are in crisis. Um, seems like most of the couples who find me are coming to me in crisis. Um, and I help them find their footing and determine kind of how to forward in terms of relationship repair and rebuild. Um, but I also work with couples in more of what's called a discernment process, like you mentioned. Yeah. That's when one or both parties are strongly contemplating divorce or separation. Um, and so what we do in a process like that is really kind of use a targeted problem solving short term approach to target the uncertainty and the ambivalence and really kind of explore perspectives. And then I support the couple in kind of determining how they want to move forward, whether they want to ultimately separate or whether they want to move forward and commit to something more long term in terms of marriage counseling. Um, or couples counseling in a more classic sense. If you decide to do that, then divorce gets taken off the table and we really hone in on what are we gonna do to try to repair this relationship. So that's kind of couples work. Um, and then on the other side of it, I work with individuals and um, I love working with people who are coming to me with all kinds of different situations that are happening. But when it comes to people who are thinking about divorce or separation, and maybe they've been thinking about it, as you know, people might sit on that question for weeks months days years years decades, yeah. decades. and so we um I, I can i provide a specialized divorce ambivalence counseling which is a goal-directed therapy similar to that of the discernment process but with an individual maybe their partner is not open to counseling maybe they really just kind of need to figure out the decision for themselves um but we take a goal directed short-term approach to tackle the ambivalence and really deal with the fear and the anxiousness and the confusion that my client is dealing with um, and tease out what their best path forward is. And that might mean trying to reel in their couple, their, their partner on couples counseling. It might mean making some changes to make the relationship more, um, more satisfying. And it might mean deciding that this isn't for them and that they, they do need to move forward with a really hard decision to move out of the relationship. Definitely. So that's one of the ways that I work with individuals. And I mean, I work with individuals who are amid their divorce as well, dealing with the grief and the trauma associated with that and the immense loss that comes um, with divorce and, and relationship transitions. And of course I work with clients that have nothing to do with the divorce process as well. Yeah. Um, relationship transitions and life transitions, you know, it all has to do with kind of tackling uncertainty and tackling change and understanding how our emotions play into all of that. That's great. And, you know, I, we, you talked about real earlier, which was great. You kind of pointed out some of the signs that somebody might know, like, hey, I, things aren't status quo for me. Things aren't great. Some indicators to look at. What do you recommend somebody do as a first step to reach out for help? And I, I don't know. I think that I have experienced in just in my own work and in just in life that it's not easy for everybody to reach out for help. So if somebody doesn't feel like they can pick up the phone and, you know, call you or call a friend or family um, member, what, what do you recommend they do? Are there other ways they can reach out for help? And just how do you how do you tell someone to first take that step and anything else about that because that's a big problem i think it's just taking the step right definitely i mean i think asking for help is really difficult for a lot of people you know i mean a lot of times you know people have are are the nurturer of, among their friends or they're right. the nurturer, and so it's a hard for them to ask for um for help themselves but you know getting ahead of it not waiting until you're extremely depressed or exhibiting concerning behaviors um if you're starting to think that talking to somebody might be a good idea that means it probably is, you know, and um, certainly if your stress or your anxiety is impeding 
your ability to enjoy your life, then you're in a space where you need to ask for some, some additional help. And, under, and remembering that asking for help is never a sign of weakness, but it's a sign of strength to be able to recognize when your problems are real and that um, you need some help to do something about them and to get yourself back to a, back to a better baseline. So, you know, in terms of what, what to do, right? I mean, social support is also huge. Uh, I'm gonna talk about therapy support, of course, but making sure that you're surrounding yourself with people who are positive, not judgmental, supportive of you, um, determining who in your support network you can cry with or talk to, you know, and make sure that you keep those numbers close, right? Um, it's the time to pick up the phone and, and ask for help when you need it. Resist the urge to isolate and allow people to be there for you just like you would for them, you know, especially like I mentioned, those folks who are, who are the, the listener and the, the um, caretaker among their friends. You wanna be there for others, let people be there for you. Maybe ask your friends to check in on you um, if, if they notice that something's off about your behavior to be honest with you about it. Um, yeah, I mean, some of those things I think are, your family and friends are essential, but sometimes you do need more, right? Sometimes. Okay your family and friends are so emotionally connected to you in the situation that it, it can be helpful and even essential to also work with a mental health professional. Um, so contacting a therapist for a consultation, most therapists offer a free consultation by phone. Um, you can send an email, most, or most certainly you can to me, and, and, and I know that most therapists will accept an email or a phone call that way and, and set up a free phone consultation. That's kind of pretty standard among therapy to, to therapists to start with. Um, you know, if, if finances are an issue, you might want to look through your insurance to determine if somebody on your insurance panel is listed. There's lots of different ways to try to find a therapist that might be a good fit for you. I have a question really okay. quick. Text by text. You know, some therapists are yeah. willing to do a, do a text. That's why I was wondering if people are willing to reach out to you or anybody else. Do you have people text you? Because sometimes that's the easiest way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I connect with some of my clients by text. I don't like to offer therapy by text, although I do. <laughs> Some therapists do that, uh, uh, I, 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 but I, I think that I, I will connect with people around scheduling or, you know, checking in on things um, briefly by text, and I think that can be a really helpful outlet. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, if you're struggling or hurting, you deserve to feel supported, and I think that's really what it comes down to, and you need to be able to know that people back and that you might need to sort of refine or develop new ways of coping with your stress because what's happening right now is, is not working. Um, sure. yeah. yeah. I want to encourage people to always, always reach out, you know, before, before things get so bad that you're not even sure if you want to anymore. Right. I mean, I think it's right. really people reach out at early signs. Definitely. And just another quick question. And I have a question that somebody had submitted that I want to ask you, but um, so therapy during the pandemic, right? People, are people doing therapy over Zoom? Are they doing it over the phone? Are they coming in to see you? Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think people that maybe haven't started therapy or are thinking about, do I do individual therapy? Do I do couples therapy? What does that mean? Do we get on the video? Or can you talk about the different ways that therapy is happening? Because I feel like that's probably changed a lot. Yeah, that's definitely changed a lot. Um, prior to the pandemic, I was super resistant to seeing anybody on video. I'll be honest about that. I was not <laughs> open to, I've always been an in-person mental health professional. I've always seen clients in the office. Um, and so I was really worried about losing the in-person connection. Yeah, uh, for sure. But like everyone, we had to make shifts and be flexible when it came to COVID. And so um, I began seeing clients on telehealth, which is a secure program. It's not Zoom, it's a secure, you know, program specifically for healthcare. And, and I think that, I know that many, many therapists, most therapists have been seeing clients primarily on telehealth for the past year. Um, and so that's generally how people are connecting. I have some clients who prefer to connect by phone uh, and aren't comfortable with the video. More and more now, people are starting to come back into the office. Um, you know, in my office, I see clients in with, with social distance and mask and COVID protocols in place for clients who need that, who need to come to the office and need to be able to have that in-person connection for a number of different reasons, whether that's, this is the only time they leave their house the whole week because they're very isolated and this is a reason to get out, um, or a couple who is in pretty significant crisis and, and needs that in-person connection with the therapist and for maybe- sure in place, but getting on a video doesn't feel comfortable to them. So for 
reasons I, I do have some clients that I've been begun seeing back in the office and I, and I'm aware of other therapists that are beginning to do the same. Um, but telehealth remains my primary outlet at the moment. Um, but I'll talk to clients and, and consider it on a case by case basis. And, and I believe that other therapists are doing the same. Um, I want to just take one minute though and say something about self care. Yes, please. That comes, you know, obviously like, Working with a therapist and a mental health professional, I don't think is ever a bad idea, but being able to sort of assess what you have in your own self-care toolbox is really, really important, right? To be able to practice and understand what your self-care strategies are. And that can mean so many different things for different people. Exercise, everybody knows that exercise boosts endorphin produ production, so it's great to get your body moving and actually has a, you know, physical connection to boosting your mood. Um, you know, going for a walk, taking a bath, attending a yoga class, online, I guess, um, <laughs> listening, to, <laughs> listening to music that feeds your soul, you know, um, getting a massage or buying new shoes. I mean, binge watching a Netflix series. It can be so many different things. Getting out for a hike, um, journaling, sketching, you know, if nothing seems to be helpful, nothing feels like you want to do it, do something anyway. You just never know when, um, something will help alleviate your pain or just even give your mind and emotions a moment of reprieve. Um, being kind and compassionate to yourself, that's a really important piece as well. And one of the things that I really try to work with clients on is understanding the connection between our emotions, our thoughts, and our behaviors, and how all three of those really influence each other. Um, and so really, if you aren't feeling it and your thoughts are in a pretty negative space, if you can shift something in your behavior even if you're not motivated to do it, sometimes that can have a pretty significant influence on your thoughts and emotions as well. So that's wanna... great. That's great. Cause not everybody, I mean, that's not going to look the same for everybody. Like you said. Yeah. Um, I had a question before we start to wrap up, I got a question from somebody ahead of time and it surrounded on parenting. So parenting and specifically foster care. So if hypothetically, just I'm wondering how you would approach this because it was something I was thinking about too. So if a family is looking at bringing in a foster child into their home and they already have a biological child, um, I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about what you would recommend in a transition like that for the family as a whole and also um, probably for the child that's already there and how uh, he or she might feel in that situation and how you would recommend that a family like that really take on this, that kind of a major life change. And, you know, obviously it's going to generate some stress. So what are your thoughts just for that viewer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, the addition of a family member is definitely a major life transition. Right. Or sometimes life transitions are welcomed and exciting and wonderful. Um, but even those transitions come with uncertainty and therefore fear and anxiety. And especially for parents who are trying to manage this process for everyone involved, their biological children, their new foster child. Um, so I think for the parents, you know, really being aware of your own emotions and stress level. And like some of the things we talked about earlier, be aware of those red flags. Notice when something's not you know, not quite working well in terms of your own self care, you have a lot to balance. So it's more than more important than ever to make sure that you're focusing on your own wellness in order to be able to be that um, balancing and supportive outlet for the rest of the family. And then you know, in terms of the mental health of the biological children in the home, I think it's, it would be really advisable to really talk about their personal role in the fostering journey in an age appropriate way. I mean, it really depends on the age of those kids, of course, but the kids who are already in the home, what, what will change for them? You know, how are they going to, how can they contribute and share in this exciting process? You know, what will their role be? Acknowledging maybe their sacrifices um, and the things that might change for them, you know, as far as sharing attention, sharing the parents' attention, sharing toys, sharing space in the home. Um, yeah, I mean, acknowledging that that is a sacrifice and a change for them and, and looping them in, having them be part of the process. Maybe they get to kind of make some age appropriate decisions about how space is going to be shared or that kind of thing. So they feel they're part of, they're, they're part of the shift. Um, and, you know, that, I think that could really help them not to become as resentful um, and to find things in their routine also that can remain constant. And maybe to also find ways to give the kids, the bio biological kids, some individual attention and, and care so that they, you know, don't feel like they're being lost in the shuffle. 
Um, I don't know, just be being aware of how everybody's coping with the change, right? Just as you are aware of your own red flags, it's always important to be aware of what's happening with your kiddos. What are, is there any changes in their mood, appetite, sleep, socialization, isolation, motivation, level, all those things. Um, and I think when it comes to all the children, the foster ch child, the biological children, open communication as much as possible. And again, in an age appropriate way, um, talking about emotions, making it a safe space for all of the kids to be able to say how they're feeling about what's going on and what the changes are um, and, and, and validating that, it's, that it can be tough. And that even though we're all excited and that this is a really fun and, and special time for the family, that, that, that doesn't mean it's not also hard. Definitely. Oh, that's great. I think that's super helpful. Um, and yeah, every just dealing with a major transition or any transition, I think that's great advice. Um, before we wrap up, let's tell everybody how they can reach you. So Melissa is available at Melissa, M-E-L-I-S-S-A, at betteryouseattle.com. She also recently got on Instagram, which is great, and she's going to get on more social media, hint, hint. Um, so you can find her at Better You Seattle. Melissa, any other ways you want people to reach out to you, phone number? Um, do you want to give that to everybody? Um, you know, I think that actually the best way to do it is to go onto my website or shoot me an email. Oh, yeah. BetterUseattle.com is my website, and you can I'll submit a form on there. My phone number is on there as well. Um, my email address is on there. Like Michelle said, it's Melissa at BetterUseattle.com. Um, and I would really look forward to hearing from anybody. Great. That's awesome. Thank you. We're going to do this again. So uh, I appreciate it. Appreciate all the help that you gave everybody today. And we'll see you soon. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. All right. Bye.